uh, it's always an honor to, to help out in MC. I've been a, a, Nate and I were talking on sidebar before the actual uh, webinar started. Um, I've been a member of NEMSI for many years now and go back quite a few years. I've always been a fan to try and uh, bolster the, the professionalism of EMS education as a general rule. Um, my background, real quick, as Nate said, it's a hodgepodge of different types of EMS and fire for the last 32 years. Uh, starting in the military as a, as a Navy corpsman, serving with the Marine Corps, I was a scrunt, I think they called me, a squid grunt. Um, Transitioned uh, out of the military, went into New York City EMS. I was a New York City paramedic for many years. I uh, went down to Florida. I uh, was down as a firefighter paramedic, uh, flight medic, and got heavy into training and education down in Florida. Uh, came up to Virginia, and ironically enough, I was recruited uh, into the FBI. It sounds like a Hollywood fairy tale, but it was true. <laughs> I actually almost blew it. The guy who tried to recruit me, I thought it was a joke, and I blew it off. Um, but I, luckily enough, I reached out to him and everything came to fruition. I went through the hiring process and I came into the bureau, uh, not as an agent, uh, but as a support employee. And they recruited me based on a background uh, search, I suppose, where my name came up in a few different arenas from uh, military, uh, combat time, street time, training and education, uh, aviation. So I guess those key searches and whatever data bank they were looking at pulled up my name. So it's just funny how things happen. Um, but my heart and soul have always been uh, with EMS and fire and, and uh, training and education. So what I'm gonna take you through now is how we, I created this rule of operational medicine, some of the hurdles we ran into and why we ended up almost going backwards in, in concept as far as how we train our SWAT medical operators. Now, just a point of terminology, you're going to hear me refer uh, to some of our medical operators as medics from time to time. Um, that's a matter of semantics and terminology we use within the FBI. We follow more of a, a DOD or Department of Defense type of mentality, uh, if you will, on terminology. And we'll call our EMRs, our EMTs, our paramedics, all medics. Uh, so just to keep you clear on the vernacular as I roll through, uh, I'll get specific um, from time to time and you'll see. But throughout this presentation, if you do have a question, please, please don't hesitate to, uh, to type it in and Nate will stop me. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions as we go through. Uh, if you'd rather wait until the end, it's totally up to you. So when we look at tactical medics and tactical medicine, um, Oh, I can't get the thing to change. Let's see, let's do this instead. Hold on. Ah, there we go. Uh, I've always been reluctant to use the term tactical medic. It seems like a very overused term nowadays. Everybody who shops at a 5-Eleven or a, you know, a North American Rescue, all of a sudden they put some, they molly some gear onto their chest and all of a sudden, poof, they're a tactical medic. Um, so I think it's an overused term, however, if you look at the truest definition of tactical, uh, it's just doing something in a less than perfect environment. And dare I say anything in EMS, uh, when we're out there in the field doing our job, it's less than a perfect environment. Um, but here in this presentation, we're specifically talking about our SWAT operator medics, as we call them in the CI. Uh, so we're looking at, in the truest sense of the word, a tactical medic based on a military model. And we'll get into how the FBI has sort of fallen into the tactical medic arena, because we're not Department of Defense, we're not necessarily civilians. We fall into this real weird gray area. So when I was handed this uh, bag of responsibility to kind of put together uh, the FBI schoolhouse, I started looking at what we used to be, all right? What was the early tactical medic. Now, when I was a, a corpsman uh, with the Marine Corps back in the day, uh, we had very basic equipment. Um, dare I say, I, I personally, uh, although I was an EMT when I came into the Navy, I was thrust into a situation, uh, situations being uh, combat and this tactical medical position. I was 18, 19 years old. I was scared to death. I didn't know what I was doing, but I had the basics down. Uh, I understood the basic techniques, I had basic equipment, I had basic concepts. And if you look back in history, 
uh, I mean, from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, the medics that were involved in care, whether it be frontline care or rear echelon care, it was basic concepts uh, or concepts. Uh, now we go more to the modern day medic and you look at your modern day corpsmen, your 68 whiskeys, your 18 deltas, you get into your special operations community. Boy, they've got some advanced skills. Uh, they've got some advanced concepts and tremendous amounts of knowledge uh, from Reboa to TXA to surgical techniques, you name it, they are high speed, low drag. They've got a lot of tools in their tool bag, so to speak. And they're asked to do a lot in a very crappy scenario. But when I compared the two, old school medic to modern day medic, the question I asked myself was, all right, who's doing it better? It advanced the right way to go in the tactical arena is staying basic the better way to go? And I really couldn't nail down a good answer as to who was doing it better, who was getting better results. You know, for some, uh, whether it be civilian tactical medics, whether it be uh, DOD tactical medics, federal of any kind, some decided they wanted to push forward and they wanted the advanced techniques, the advanced uh, bells and whistles as they're called, the new shiny object. They wanted to do all the cool stuff well, I looked at our mission in the FBI and I looked at our capabilities and uh, what we were being asked to do. And dare I say, I started to look the other way, uh, which was really eye-opening to a lot of people. Uh, they, well, you're, you're, you should be moving forward. Everybody's going forward. Everybody's getting more advanced. But I started to look at the data and started to challenge that idea. And everybody has seen these slides. Everybody has seen the data and they've looked to what's killing people in combat. Now, when I say combat, again, I use that term very loosely. I don't care if you're overseas uh, in country and receiving casualties, or if you're on Main Street USA, everybody bleeds the same. It's just a matter of what kind of an environment you're in. So whether you're in quote unquote, true combat scenario, or if you're in the middle of an active shooter or an IED blast on Main Street USA, it's really the same thing, right? The human body is the human body. And what we found is hemorrhage was killing people. And this is nothing new to anybody in this audience. Everybody knows that. So when we're looking at, although this is an older study, it's still applicable for current day. This is what we looked at. What was killing people in the immediate on the X arena? And that's what we had to focus on. So then you look at, all right, from the battlefield to our neighborhood, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, trauma was what was killing most of our folks. And any of us as EMS educators, we all know the answer. It's all about time. You know, whether you want to uh, regurgitate the golden hour, which has been somewhat debunked over the years, or however you want to look at it, bleeding is what's killing people. And when we went to a March mnemonic years ago, massive hemorrhage airway. Uh, most of us know the March mnemonic, and we'll discuss it again here in a minute. Um, when you told me that I had to put airway in the back seat during my training and education, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Like, no, that's impossible. Uh, for forever and a day, it was ABCs, ABCs, airway was first. We were told to abandon that concept and put hemorrhage control first in the trauma setting, which turned out to be true. That's what was killing people. So I took the data into consideration. I looked at the, the current latest and greatest um, information coming out of uh, combat overseas. And I started to slowly but surely formulate an idea as to what I wanted the Bureau's training to be for our tactical operators. So just to take a step back and give you a bit more perspective on what we do uh, within the FBI, um, we have 56 SWAT teams. I say that they're all part-time and that's for the most part true. There's only one full-time uh, counterterrorism team or SWAT team within the FBI and that's the hostage rescue team. But all the other teams, uh, they may be busy. Don't get me wrong, they may be busy, but none of them are dedicated full-time SWAT teams. What that also alludes to is that the medics that are assigned to those SWAT teams are part-time, which was part of my hurdle as an educator, 
is I didn't have full-time medics to train. I had uh, gun-toting, uh, badge-wearing special agents that were out there doing their job. But then when they were called upon to be the medic, that's when they put that outfit on. So my audience was always part-time medics, which was frustrating for me because uh, I didn't have that great depth of experience. If you're teaching to a group of EMS providers or firefighter, uh, EMTs, medics, that's their full-time job. I didn't have that. So that was an uphill battle for me. So when we look at the mission, locally speaking, if you're in downtown USA and you have a certain area, well, you know, all right, in the winter it gets cold, in the summer it gets hot. Uh, we have this indigenous type of uh, snake or spider, or, so you know your area. For our training needs, every one of our missions were different. Uh, we had local ops, we had overseas ops. Um, most were not austere, some are. Uh, you may go to the mountains of Utah, uh, or you may go to the city streets of Los Angeles or New York City. Or so you, you had a little bit of everything that you had to deal with as far as what information you were gonna present. But when SWAT teams rolled out on missions, they were usually well supported by local EMS. Uh, but it depends on where you go in the United States. Some of our teams were not supported very well and currently are not supported very well. So we have to become our own mini EMS system with flight capabilities, transport capabilities, uh, and on-scene care that we just cannot get from local resources. Um, most of the time, we're not that far away from a trauma center. Other times, we are. Uh, I was up in Alaska uh, a few years ago doing a class. And as you can imagine, <laughs> depending on where you are in the state of Alaska will dictate how far you are from a trauma center. Most of our hits are usually well planned out. Usually, uh, we'll get some no notice uh, missions from time to time where we have to sort of jump through some hoops uh, to prepare. And that's where our med planning piece comes in. So when we look at FBI versus the military versus civilian EMS, we are right in the middle. Again, we're not DOD, all right? We never claim to be, we're not the military. But at the same time, we're not civilian EMS either. Uh, we're a law enforcement agency. Uh, we're an investigative uh, entity which also created an uphill battle for me because here I am trying to put together an institution, if you will, or a training center for EMS within a law enforcement organization, an investigative organization. <laughs> so that was a little bit of a tough sell at first. So the FBI's medical program as a whole started off years ago, many years ago, long before I ever came into the Bureau, but it was always very EMT focused. And that was the only reason it was EMT focused is that's all people really knew at the time. Uh, there were EMTs and there were paramedics and that was pretty much it. Um, so if you have to imagine an organization uh, as large as the FBI with 35 to 40,000 individuals, let's just use a rough number of 600 to 1,000 medical operators within the Bureau, half of them, maybe not even half, are assigned to SWAT teams, but there were very few paramedics. Uh, I am one of a handful of paramedics in the FBI, so the vast majority of our audience are BLS. So when I really started getting involved with the FBI's medical program, it was EMT focused. And I said, okay, but there was no consistency in training. Uh, whether you are from San Diego to Maine, uh, Anchorage to Miami, there was no consistency in the training. Basically what they were told was, okay, become an EMT somewhere in your area, in your state, and then get your training and education locally uh, and submit your paperwork to us when you're done. That didn't sit well with me. I was like, okay, we're supposed to be a world-class organization. We're supposed to, and again, this is what they had to deal with at the time. So this is nobody's fault. This is just what it was but it didn't sit well with me. I wanted that consistency. Uh, and in that autonomy that the medical operators had, they had difficulty in maintaining their certifications because they may be in an area where they couldn't get training education. Uh, nobody would open the door for them or it wasn't available to them. They had to come out of pocket and pay for themselves. 
and there was no monetary compensation to these special agents to maintain their medical certifications. So you have to throw the WIFM factor in there, you know, what's in it for me? And there was nothing in it for them. So a lot of guys let it drop. And it was also very difficult to maintain skills. Uh, when you're going coast to coast and dare I say around the world, um, again, these are special agents. These are people that have a very heavy caseload and they're not out on the trucks running calls like you would like to keep those skills up. So that was the history of the FBI's medical program. And when I came in about 2012, and what was sort of posed to me was, all right, how do we fix this within the tactical community? It really started off with an idea. Um, one of the senior tactical medics um, in the bureau, uh, Tony, came to me around 2013 and said, hey, I got an idea. And he says, uh, with your background and your uh, experience, says, what do you think about spinning up and starting a tactical medical schoolhouse for our tactical medical operators. And of course, being a type A person, I said, sure, absolutely, hey, let's do it. <laughs> well, careful what you wish for, right? Uh, all of a sudden, I was the dog who bought the car. In 2014, they came to me and said, okay, let's, let's do it. So here I was, no budget, no money. Uh, although the FBI had very deep pockets, uh, mine were empty. I had no money to, to I had no budget to, to work off of. It was just me. And my mission was to train the tactical medics in the Bureau. Hmm. All right. You're all professional educators for the most part in this audience. How do you take and how do you create a nationwide slash worldwide program with one person and no budget? Hmm. <laughs> now I'm the dog who caught the car. Now what am I going to do? All right. I opened my mouth. How am I going to do this? Well, I had to do something, and I fell back on my experience as a training officer in EMS agencies and fire departments, and I said, well, I looked at it as a large EMS agency or a large fire department. You have a training center, and you have a dozen to 20 to 30 to 40 firehouses out there or EMS stations out there. Well, each state is in my mind, it's only a little firehouse or it's only a little EMS station. And the occupants and the people who work within those stations, well, those are the people I have to deal with. And I started to take it one bite at a time, right? The old analogy, how to eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. So one of the first things I did uh, was I said, well, I have to get a big hit and I've got to get information out there right away. So I kind of set the hook in these people to get them excited about EMS training and education to try to start getting everybody on the same page and not have this mixed bag of training and education. So I started pushing out online training through a few different platforms. And if I happen to mention a product um, throughout this presentation, I am in no way, in no way, shape or form endorsing any one product, but I just may let you know what it is that we use. That's it. I'm just letting you know what works for us. I'm not endorsing anything. Um, so initially we started off with 24-7 uh, EMS and we pushed that out. And guys and girls uh, enjoyed it. Uh, they started to uh, be excited about the fact that they were receiving something for free and it was giving them some CEs and it was putting EMS on the tip of their tongue and at their fingertips, whereas before it was a struggle to get any sort of training and education. So that's said, okay, well, let's do an initial EMT class. So we put together an EMT class, we advertised it internally, we got a little bit of money, and we brought in about 30 people to do a, a three and a half week kick in the chops, just five day a week crusher. It was brutal. It was anybody who has ever done a five to six day a week EMT class. Uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a lot of information to put out, it's a lot of information for the students to absorb. But I had a captive audience and I had a very, very intelligent audience, which made my life very easy. The minimum education level of any of my students was at a bare minimum of bachelor's degree. Uh, some of my students sitting in the classroom had PhDs. So for me to present the information to them was fairly easy. 
but I had to train them nonetheless. Um, so with that, we ended up having 100% first time pass rate, psychomotor and cognitive at National Registry twice. So the first time we did it, we had 100% pass rate on both. And of course, everybody thought it was a fluke. Everybody internal, uh, you always have your naysayers. Uh, they thought it was a fluke. Okay, you got lucky on that one. Well, the following year, we did a, a mirror image. We did the same exact class and we had the same exact results. It was only after that second year that people really started to take notice and say, hey, all right, uh, this guy must know what he's talking about. He's doing a good job. He's got everybody excited. So now I started to look for trends and weaknesses. Now I really started to formulate a plan. of How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna put together this nationwide training center? And I say I a lot, not to be arrogant, but it was really only me. <laughs> of course I had help, don't get me wrong. There was some help internally, um, but the buck kind of stopped with me. And if it fell apart and failed, it was my fault. It was my responsibility. So what I started to do was I created a roadshow. I started to take the program uh, out onto the road. And I would take, um, I'm stationed out of Quantico, as Nate said, with the hostage rescue team. Um, but what I did is I took the program mobile. And let's just use Chicago as an example. I took the class to Chicago. I reached out to Chicago Fire Department. I said, hey, can we utilize your facility? Can we utilize your equipment? Can we utilize some of your personnel to help us do this? And with their help, and obviously with the um, assistance of the local field office there in Chicago, we hosted a program in Chicago and it was a fantastic success. And we repeated that over and over again across the country. So by taking the show on the road, we had just fantastic results. But as I started to take it on the road and I started to look at the tactical medical program globally, I started to realize that we were training guys and girls three and a half to four weeks at a time, just this incredible uh, obligation and pulling them away from their casework for a long period of time. It was just, a, it, was, it was a lot. So I turned to my superiors and I said, well, let's look at EMR versus EMT. And of course, EMR wasn't exactly a well-known uh, entity. So they all looked at me you know, like I had something growing out of my chest. And I said, well, let's look at it. Let's look at EMR. Because if you look at what an EMT does and what we're actually asking them to do within their mission, they're only using about 10% of what we're training them to do as an EMT. So a lot of it is superfluous information that is confusing them and just a waste of time. So we looked at it and we spoke to our medical director and we got him on board and we allowed our medical operators to have a bit of an expanded scope of practice. And we'll explain that here in a little bit. But with EMR, we found that we would probably have a significant amount of time savings, cost savings, ease of recertification, but we were going backwards. That didn't sit well with a lot of people. Now they were really looking at me cross-eyed. What do you mean you wanna go backwards? E EMR is less than EMT. And I said, yeah, sometimes you have to take a step back to move forward. Uh, so within the program itself, it was a Department of Transportation um, EMR program. However, we customized it to cover all the mandated requirements set forth by DOT, but we customized it to make it more tactically applicable. So we focused a lot of the care on our TCCC guidelines. We did not implement tactics in this. Now, as I said before, I am not a special agent. That's not my job. My job is to be a paramedic for the FBI so I'm staying in my lane. This is what I do. My job is to teach people how to be medics in crappy situations. So it's not my job to say, okay, this is how you clear a room. This is how you go down a hallway. Mm -mm, nope, <laughs> that's not my job. My job is to teach them how to be the medic on the team. I wanted them to train with their weapons. I wanted them to train like they fight. So we deal with people who are geared up like stormtroopers. But we also deal with people who are undercover. So they can't go in with everything we would like them to go in with. So we had to do a lot of improv teaching. But we wanted them to learn to work with their weapons, work with the patient's weapons. 
And we focused our assessment on the March pneumonic and massive hemorrhage, uh, airway, uh, respiration, circulation, uh, hypothermia, head injury, but we broke it down and we tried to make it even easier. And remember, although I'm dealing with academically very, very smart individuals, this is not their full-time job. So I had to make it easy to remember in a stressful situation. So I had repetitive mantras that you'll see here in the next slide. But at the end of the day, I focused on massive hemorrhage, airway, move. Stop the bleeding, open the airway, move. We got into casualty collection points, CCPs, medical planning for missions. And we really started to reinforce that tiered approach of, all right, our EMR, uh, he or she, they're a trigger puller, right? They're in the stack, they're going in the door. And if things go sideways on the X, they're the ones that are going to provide that immediate life-saving care of stopping the bleeding, opening the airway, and moving. Moving them to where? Out to the breach point, out to the, the casualty collection point out in the street or wherever it was designated to the next level of care. Maybe that next level of care is one of the SBI EMTs. And then from there, that EMT is trained to do what they have to do and get them to the next level of care, being me in the helicopter or civilian EMS paramedic or whatever. So we really reinforce that tier approach or that tiered approach to care. But throughout the training, throughout all of the classes, I always made it a point to stay in my lane and remember what my objective was. My objective was emergency medicine. I was not there to teach these guys how to shoot, move, none of that. That was not what I do. Those repetitive mantras are repeated over and over and over again in the class. Self-aid, buddy aid, Medicaid. Right? We teach them self-application of tourniquets, all right, hemorrhage control. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we have to, and I have to understand the tactical mission wherever we are. And I'm not spouting off any sort of uh, classified tactics here. If you go to any SWAT team across the country, the tactic is pretty much the same you neutralize the threat first and take care of those people who are injured second. And that's pretty commonplace nowadays. So when I talk about self-aid, buddy aid, take care of yourself, put a tourniquet on yourself. Once the threat is neutralized, just take care of your buddy. Once you're finished taking care of your buddy, get them to the medic. Let the, med let the medic take care of them. Stop the bleeding, open the airway, move. That is the constant mantra and that's the foundation of our training. And some of these pictures that I have off here on the side, um, some of the uniforms look a little different. Uh, this is actually the Nauru uh, group um, uh, over in the UK. So we work with a lot of our um, overseas partners in training and education, not to mention our DOD partners uh, and our local uh, civilian partners across the country. So when we look at our kit and we look at our, our equipment, um, I field phone calls all the time. And people ask me, hey, what do you carry in your tactical drug kit, your, ta your tactical drug box? And I said, well, that's easy. You got a pen? Said, yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, I don't have a tactical drug box. And there's this long, uncomfortable silence on the phone. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I said, don't get me wrong. Drugs may be necessary. And pharmacology and pharmaceuticals may be necessary in the, in the care of your patient, but not initially. On the X, on the CCP, there's no need. And that's that's just an that's our personal preference. That's the way we operate. So when we talk about equipment, we train like we fight. So if you look here, the kit um, that I have on, it's basically uh, all basic equipment that I have in front of me. So if I'm not if I'm not working out of an operator's IFAC, the individual first aid kit that they wear on their person. I have basic medical equipment on me that I'm going to use. I have nothing really advanced on my person. Although on my leg, I have a drop pouch for airway. There's a few other things. But for the most part, when it comes to training, tourniquets, NPAs, dressing, moving devices, and improv. We train and we teach to a concept, not a product. That's really one of the biggest things that we try to get across to people is, okay, we're going to teach you about a cat tourniquet. We're gonna to teach you about a soft T wide. We're gonna whatever, but that's nice. We want you to understand what you're doing. 
So it's always about conceptual learning, not product learning. So they can think outside the box and improvise when they have to. And that's really part of the basis of our training. But we don't really train the advanced stuff. IVs, that's when you're in route. Drugs, that's when you're in route. Uh, now, the only thing we're going to give somebody, uh, maybe at the CCP, depending on patient count, would be pain medication. That's probably about it, but that's all depending. Uh, so, kind of realism in training. And this is where the wheels fall off for a lot of training centers, and it's not their fault. It comes down to money, it comes down to resources. I have been extremely fortunate, although I have no money, I have no budget. The places that I go, um, when I go to Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Miami, anywhere that I do this training, I'm welcomed with open arms by the receiving organizations that are willing to help me. And they give me the sun, the moon, and the stars. It is fantastic. The resources that they allow me to use to train my people, but we get their people involved too. Uh, I don't care what alphabet you work for. Um, if you're part of our training, if we have seats, we invite everybody in. But the realism uh, from mannequins to creating that realistic environment, we don't want training stars. We don't want to notionalize anything. So if you tell me you're going to put a tourniquet on, put it on. You tell me you're going to put a dressing on, all right? put it on. Uh, you tell me you're going to move somebody, well, let's move them. And the logistics of doing that, all of a sudden, all the lights start coming on and students start to realize, okay, I've got this tourniquet in the wrong place. Okay, this moving device doesn't work. Okay, this dressing is crap. <laughs> right? But because they purchased it, they packed it in their bag and they never used it. We don't want that. We don't want any training scars. Everything is actually done. We don't notionalize anything. And we put them in situations that are going to be realistic or as realistic as possible. So what did we discover about EMR versus EMT? It's a one week class. I've been in training and education for over 20 years now. Uh, and I can say with 100% certainty that I cannot stand PowerPoint. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Uh, I don't read slides, although in this presentation, I'm sort of referring to a few bullet points here and there. Um, but we adopted a hybrid model. And again, this is no endorsement. This just happens to be what we use. We went with uh, Jones and Bartlett for our EMR program. And what I do is when I put together the initial EMR training, I send the actual didactic information and materials out about two months before the face-to-face -face meeting. They take all the exams, they do all the reading, all the book work before I ever see them. Then when I get them Monday through Friday, it's we hit the wave tops on some of the didactic material, the important things such as hemorrhage control, airway, that sort of thing. But then the rest of the day, every day, is nothing but lanes and skills and scenario-based learning. That's it. So we a one week class, I'm sorry, from a four week class, well, one week class. Um, it only costs us, give or take, about $200 per student versus putting them through an entire one semester EMT class or a three to four week condensed EMT class that can range up to about $3,000 per student. Our focus is very simple. It's March as far as an assessment goes, CPR, basic skills. Um, we do give them a familiarization of medical emergencies and civilian patient assessment, vital signs, uh, sample, OP, QRST, that sort of thing. But our goal in our medical assessment and our medical training isn't, or medical emergencies, isn't to make them diagnosticians. That's not what we're trying to do. All we want them to do is recognize, is this patient sick and dying, not sick and dying. I want them to look at somebody and say, <laughs> you look awful. Let me call 911 and get them here. I don't know what's wrong with you, but <laughs> I'm going to make sure the professionals are on their way. So we take them through your typical acute coronary syndrome, stroke, ultimate mental status, diff breather, your more common medical uh, complaints. But we train them more in recognition of who's sick versus not sick, and then how to assist that higher level provider when they get there, how to spike an IV bag if necessary, how to maybe put a monitor on, how to be that next extra set of hands. 
And what we found by scaling the information back, uh, so to speak, and going from EMT to EMR, was there was less superfluous information for the operators to be concerned with. They focused in on what was important and they had a better comprehension of it and they had better skills retention when we saw them a year or two years later. What we also found is a greater retention across the board in the Bureau of Medical Operators because now they only have to do 16 hours of CEs every two years versus 40 at the National Registry because we are considered to be a national registry organization. We mandate national registry as our basic uh, or as our baseline for certification. And we are recognized by national registry as our own state, which means we can self-certify at the EOR and EMT level, which makes things logistically a lot easier for us. Um, but with the expanded scope of practice that our medical director provided to us, we train our EMRs to do superglottic airways, kings, eye gels, needle decompression, things that even most EMTs can't do across the country, we allow our EMRs to do. So when we roll out on a mission, regardless as to whether it's an EMT or an EMR in the stack, the skill set for both is exactly the same. Uh, internally at an administrative level, there are differences between EMR and EMT and what they're allowed to do administratively. But the scope of practice and the hands-on capabilities of either is exactly the same. It really works very well for us. Well, then the question came up, all right, Mike, you're going to certify these people at the initial level. How do we maintain that? Because now this is a revolving door. Every two years, we have to make sure we're, we're up and running. So we created certification for research programs. Uh, we have a, what we call the EMT refresher, but EMRs obviously can partake. Uh, jump in on that as well. We do these same thing. It's a road trip. We'll go to Chicago, Detroit, New York City, Los Angeles, uh, you name it. Uh, we've hit so many states now over the last five, six years. It's incredible. And we'll use the local talent, uh, the local subject matter experts. Uh, nobody wants to listen to what we call the self licking ice cream cone. If I were the person doing all the training, teaching every single class, people would get sick and tired of listening to me. <laughs> so what we do is I go out to the local uh, field office. We start to create relationships between the field office and the local talent, the fire department, TMS agencies. We invite some of their tactical medics in or their experienced street providers in. And they're the ones that help me teach these refresher classes. And it puts a different spin on it. It gives our medical operators a different perspective but we always keep it applicable to our mission. What are we doing in the FBI? How do we operate? So we have that nice mix of what we need to get done in the FBI as per our mission, plus what's the latest and greatest that the civilian EMS community is seeing, because that's what they do 24 seven. So they are the subject matter experts. So we have three day classes for refreshers, but we also have what we call a core two class because part of what we started to recognize was, all right, yeah, our guys and girls need refreshers to get their hours, but we also need that hands-on skill that most people lack. So what we created, what we call the Core 2 program. This Core 2 program is nothing but Monday through Friday, they're in the back of an ambulance. Typically it's in an inner city environment and they just get crushed for eight to 10 hours a day for five days, there's no classroom. It's just complete immersion in inner city 911. And it is just fantastic. We've had tremendous results uh, and feedback from our guys and girls that have done it. We also try to really participate in cadaver labs. Uh, anywhere we go, we try to get into a cadaver lab, do anatomy and physiology review, skills review. Um, the gentleman you see uh, there with me, that's Dr. Werner Spitz. Um, he, He's 90 some odd years old. Uh, he's done over 40,000 forensic <laughs> autopsies. And it was just fantastic for him to uh, offer to help us out and walk us through a couple of, uh, of autopsies. It was just, it was incredible experience. Um, but the cadaver labs are invaluable with that 3D model of 
what's going on under the skin in the trauma world, in the medical world, and to perform the procedures on some of these cadavers uh, versus a sterile mannequin. Uh, so that was, has been a tremendous success for us as well whenever we can get our hands on it. And then of course, there's debriefing. This is actually a hundred and some odd year old pub over in the UK. Uh, it's usually where your best debriefings take place. Um, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? How can we change it? Every year, I try to change up the program a little bit. I don't want to get too comfortable. I don't want to get stale. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. So I'm constantly questioning, what am I doing? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And it's so important to be self-critical. Uh, if you just continue doing what you're doing uh, without any thought as to how I can do it better, well, you, then, then we're losing, uh, in my opinion. And the second that I think that I'm doing it the absolute best possible way I can do it, and I shouldn't be listening to anybody else, I am wrong, and I need to retire. So I am always open to suggestion. And as a matter of fact, every place we go, every location we go to, the program gets tweaked a little bit and changed a little bit based on our audience and based on our cadre. So it's never the same program twice. We meet all the NREMT criteria and all the DOT criteria, but the format and the way we present it is always different, which is wonderful. Uh, so nobody's ever experiencing the same class twice. So currently, we've trained thousands of personnel, from bureau personnel to any other alphabet within the federal government you can imagine, the DOD. Um, civilian SWAT teams. Uh, we are an ASHI, American Safety and Health Institute uh, training center. Um, we put all of our CPR through ASHI. Um, we are recognized by NAEMT to do certain programs. We do an internal wilderness program. We do an internal law enforcement first aid program for our non-medical operators. So if we have a SWAT team and we have one medic for the team, all the other operators uh, have the ability to be trained up to what's called the law enforcement first aid level. It's an internal program uh, that we do. It's basically bleeding control, if you want to look at it that way. We do about 20 to 25 classes a year. Uh, we've saved the Bureau well over a million dollars uh, by doing our own internal training and sort of uh, eliminating the need for contractors. Uh, during COVID, and all of us have been sort of dynamic in our approach to handling training and education with COVID. Um, I've created 26 different research videos that I've posted internally uh, for, our, uh, for our operators, but a lot of them are also um, on YouTube as well. There's a way to find them, and I'm a technological idiot, so how I even created these videos, I couldn't tell you how I pulled it together, but in an effort to maintain the the momentum of training and education, I created all these videos. So you might be able to find them uh, on a Google search at YouTube. And within the Bureau, we're supporting EMR, EMT, AEMT, and paramedic uh, recertification uh, in the tactical arena, about 600 people. Um, so we keep busy. And if anybody recognizes that picture, uh, Squad 57, uh, I was actually in Los Angeles not long ago, and I came across the station and I took a picture of it for those of you who are old enough to remember what it is. So that's our current status. And it's still one guy, me. <laughs> and I say that not to toot my own horn, trust me, but just to let you know, any of you that are out there doing training education and you're a part of a training center, and you're a training center director beating your head against a wall because you don't have staff, you don't have money. Trust me, I understand, but there is a way to do it. <laughs> not to say that I've mastered it, I have not, but I figured out a way for my mission to work. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. So in summary, am I saying that there's no room for ALS in the tactical arena for tactical medicine? Absolutely not. I am not saying that. Uh, this just happens to work for us. We went backwards and we stuck to basics. We went back to EMR versus EMT. Uh, we tweaked our scope of practice 
We implemented refreshers and core two and cadaver lab. So we really customized it and it works for us. The way we do it may not work for you or your organization, but this is just what we have done. We're keeping it basic. We have that repetitive mantra, self-aid, buddy aid, Medicaid, stop the bleeding, open the air, we move. And it's working very well for us. Uh, our people are retaining their certifications. They're retaining the skills and the knowledge and they're hungry for more. Now I've got this revolving door of guys and girls that are constantly wanting to come back for more training, which is exciting. So for me, it's always been practice like you fight, train like you fight. Use your own gear. Don't have those training scars. Uh, don't uh, notionalize what you're going to do. If you come into a, a scenario slick and no gear on, well, and that's how you train. If you come in jocked up like, uh, you know, like a stormtrooper, well, that's what you need to be wearing. Uh, if you carry a long gun, carry it. Uh, so we don't want training scars. And that's really the, the biggest thing I'm trying to get across to you is how we train is so important. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Those are my, my ferocious beasts there. They're in a uh, constant uh, state of readiness. They're like coiled springs. Um, I'm always available for questions, uh, for advice. Uh, quite frankly, I'll take any advice anybody has. But if um, you're an educator and you're looking for a different way of doing business, uh, you're looking for uh, help in any way, I'm always available. Uh, my email address is here. Um, Anytime, uh, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to happy to discuss anything we do. Nothing that we do is classified, so it's uh, an open book. And if I end up being in your area uh, sometime here in the near future, um, you're always welcome to come by and see what we do. Uh, again, nothing's classified. We have a, we have a lot of fun with it. Um, thank you again for your time. Uh, it's, I'm honored uh, to be able to present to you all. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, Nate, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was super informative, and I know it's going to benefit a lot of people in attendance. But we have received a couple of questions coming in. Before we start with those, I do want to just uh, give you some props. We've been getting some several comments sent into the chat, people that were involved in one of your courses in Chicago, and they've been saying it is completely unmatched in its value that it gave to the students and um, that you you really did well and that they're super thankful for your everything that you guys did when you were there. So I just uh, want I, to Thank you. So I can't, I can't speak highly enough uh, for Chicago, and I specifically mentioned them because they were one of the first ones to help us out, and they are a fantastic organization. They were great. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to, I wanted to let you know that we were getting some comments before we get started with the questions. But our first question is, um, it may have several answers, but how could someone get involved with their local field office? Uh, th uh, this came from a SWAT medic in the Omaha, Nebraska area, but they're just kind of curious how they can involve themselves a little bit more in this type of stuff. Yeah, ironically enough, we were out in Omaha. Uh, and I get lost in the sea of dates and times and I get confused where I have been and haven't been. But we were out in Omaha a couple of years ago. We did a class out there. Um, probably the easiest way or the best way to do it, um, each field office within the FBI has a point of contact for medical. Uh, some people may say, oh, that must be the nurse. Not necessarily. Uh, not every field office has a nurse assigned to the field office. And at the same time, every field office their nurse isn't necessarily directly involved with the tactical medical program. So what you need to do is if you're interested in getting involved in medical training tactical team, reach out to the SWAT team and find out who their lead medic is on their SWAT team. Um, again, that's not classified information. Tell them who you are and what you're looking to do um, because they're always looking for venues for training and education for themselves and for their team. And they're always looking to cross train. Because let's say that they use your organization on a mission, uh, they want to know who they're dealing with. They want to know who they're working with, and they want to train with you. Trust me, they do. Uh, all you need to do is reach out to the field office, find out who the lead um, medic is, and, uh, and reach out. Uh, and at a bare minimum, email me. <laughs> email me, tell me who you are, and I'll do a, an e-invite and get you in touch with the right person. 
Awesome. And our next question, you, you sort of touched on this, but I don't know, maybe you have a little bit more you could expand on. Uh, how many courses and research you do in a year? I know you mentioned on one of the previous slides about 20 to 25 courses, but is Rita certification all sort of an ongoing process now that it's been moved online with COVID? Yeah, 2020, we took a little hit. When I say a little hit, everybody did. Uh, when it comes to the in-person face training and education, which is why I made all those videos. But on a normal year, you want to uh, call it your normal, it varies because, like I said, I'm always changing it and based on the need in the field. But as a general rule, I typically do um, two to three initial, well, let me give you the real numbers. I am funded now to do a certain amount, but I'll tell you how many I do total uh, because there's what I'm funded to do and what some field offices actually pay for. And it's, it sounds a little weird, but in total, um, I'll typically do five to six EMR classes per year. Um, I'll typically do one refresher, EMR, EMT refresher per quarter. And we also do an EMR to EMT transition. So what we tend to do, and also the method to the madness, is our initial rollout for our initial certification is EMR. And those people who like it and they're hungry and they want more, well, now we'll invest more time and more money into them and we'll take the EMRs and actually do a transition class. And we'll, we do a EMR to EMT class within the Bureau. Now we're doing two of those a year uh, because of the demand. Uh, the core two program uh, that I mentioned, the uh, basically just a 911 five days a week class. We do two to three of those a year. Um, and then a mishmash of other uh, miscellaneous classes throughout the year. So it adds up very quickly. Uh, but on a quarterly basis, we're doing initial classes and refreshers uh, all over the country. One is asking, does the FBI hire non-LEO paramedics uh, locally? Yes. Yes, LEO is law enforcement officer. Okay, sorry about that. Um, now, locally, yeah, uh, locally is just a matter of terminology. Take me as an example. Uh, again, I'm not a special agent. I came in through what's called a support route. Uh, they'll do a direct hire. So they'll take people who have a certain background, a certain set of skills, and they'll bring them in and hire them. And you are FBI, you're a credentialed, you know, FBI employee you're a part of the team only difference is i'm not a special agent so that's usually the way you come into the fbi without being a law enforcement officer uh, but the hiring process is still the same regardless of where you live uh, it's about a year-long hiring process uh polygraphs background investigation it's uh it's a bear <laughs> but um uh, but yes, you can come into the Bureau and not be LEO. Cool. And um, can do you accept volunteers to teach things such as PHTLS or something to the teams? Uh, locally, they're always looking for help. So if, let's say, you're in Omaha, Nebraska, just use that as an example, and the main uh, point of contact for the medical for the SWAT team reaches out and says, hey, I understand you've got a PHTLS class going on. Uh, is there any way we can get some of our guys into that? That's usually the way it happens. So if you open the door to uh, FBI medical personnel and offer them seats in classes that you're doing, uh, most of the time you're gonna get takers uh, because a lot of times, unfortunately, they just don't know that it's out there because they're not in that inner circle, right? They're so busy doing other things they don't know that they have these tremendous resources right in their backyard. And that's why when I go out to these local field offices and I do these, the road show, so to speak, all of a sudden I open Pandora's box to these field offices and I say, listen, these are the resources you have right in your backyard. This way when I leave, they continue to have that relationship when I move on to go somewhere else. Awesome, so um, our next question, is 
do you have a care under fire expectation or suggested policy or procedure philosophies? This is coming from a provincial program manager with a provincial special ops program in Canada, he says he's struggling with too much effort or focus being spent on ALS interventions instead of ex expediting an extrication strategy. Okay, that's a, that's a great, great question. And I definitely feel your pain. That's exactly how we started. Uh, and that's the whole basis of this presentation is more isn't necessarily better. Uh, and even the term care under fire, I think is a misleading uh, term. And we struggle with that concept, not the concept, but we struggle with that terminology in the FBI. But every agent that goes through the academy goes through what is called, called a care under fire class, where they're taught hemorrhage control, tourniquets, CPR, that sort of thing. Um, so in the truest sense of the word to use that phrase from TCCC is, is misleading as far as I'm concerned. So my advice to you would be strip the terminology away and ironically enough, go back to basics. And sometimes when you're dealing with executive management, you have to show them numbers and say, hey, listen, this is what's killing people. You know, there's no science for the ALS providers that are listening to this. You know, now we're hearing how epinephrine doesn't work and years ago, lidocaine and, you know, I was of the Bertillium days and that went away. <laughs> so nothing we do in the ALS arena has really been wholeheartedly proven to work. The only thing that we can prove that works right now in the advanced world is defibrillation um, and in the basic world, hemorrhage control. Uh, so what you need to do is bring some numbers to your executive management and say, listen, we need to scale this back and make our medical operators good at one thing, make them very good at hemorrhage control and have them understand, stop the bleeding, move them to somebody that can take them to the next level and then provide the ALS care. So I don't know if that helps or not, because I know you're going to be fighting an uphill battle with that. Uh, but if you show them numbers to where hemorrhage control is what's saving patients and focus your energy on that, that may be what gets you over that hump 